Breaches and cybersecurity incidents are making headlines every day. What are you doing to be prepared? Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast, brought to you by Tripwire, the show that explores cybersecurity for the enterprise and how to identify and protect against cyber threats before they happen. Listen for techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. Now, here's your host, Tim Erlin. Welcome, everyone, to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. I'm Tim Erlin, Vice President of Strategy at Tripwire. And today I am joined by Kurt Dukes, who is the Executive Vice President and General Manager of the Center for Internet Security, or CIS. Welcome, Kurt. Hey, Tim. Thank you for having me on. Glad to have you here. Now, CIS, I think a lot of our audience is, is familiar with CIS, probably from either the critical security controls or the CIS benchmarks. I think those are the the two uh, artifacts, uh, models, capabilities, whatever you want to call them, that uh, CIS is best known for. But we're not here to talk about those. We're here to talk about the community defense model, which I think I wasn't familiar with prior to um, you know our, our initial conversations. But I think it's it's pretty interesting and exciting. So, Kurt, why don't you start by just explaining a little bit about what the community defense model is? Yeah, I'd love to. So uh, the community defense model has been in existence for, I guess, a little over a year now. And roughly speaking, you know, the theory behind the case uh, for for CDM is, you know, we'd like to be able to use one or more publicly available authoritative sur- summaries of attacks uh, and and basically that would help us identify the most important types of attacks uh, that you know uh, organizations have to deal with on a, on a on a you know daily, weekly, monthly basis. The second part of this really is around you know describing the atomic elements of those attacks uh, using using a framework. And in this case, we actually use the MITRE attack framework, and then we create uh, an attack pattern. Uh, which consists of um, in using MITRE attack um, um, terminology, uh, attack te- uh, tactics, and techniques. And then finally, we had analyze those elements of those patterns against individual um, CIS controls and the underlying safeguards in order to establish the specific security value of each of those safeguards uh, in, within that attack pattern. You can also more clearly state the impact of not applying any individual uh, safeguard. Uh, in, in essence, does it have any value against a step in an important attack? You know, I, uh, Tim, I would tell you this is not a magic bullet or a perfect system, but it is driven by real life data and is much more clearly defines the use of data and bounds the judgment and opinions of individuals. It also helps us move from um, from a model where every company needs to read these reports separately to a sort of central shared labor of translation from attacks to action. And you know, the Center for Internet Security does that on behalf of the community. So uh, one of the things I always liked about the the um, the critical security controls and the underlying safeguards is that. I always felt like they were based in sort of real world data from from the their their you know initial introduction um that was that was sort of the major advantage how does the community defense model differ from how the uh the security controls themselves are are generated and defined and prioritized yeah that's a great question so Historically, um, the critical security controls, you know, we would get together within a community and each community member, you know, brought, you know, uh, their stories of, uh, of cyber threats, you know, based on the data they had available to them. And that kind of helped us form the uh, critical security controls. And so what we wanted to do, um, as we noticed, uh, many organizations uh, were creating uh, annual threat summaries, right? So we have the, the Verizon data breach um Report, um, you know, we have uh, IBM's X Force, um, and so what we found was that by having that type of data available to us now, we could actually take that data um, and synthesize it into um, what we're, what would we call the top five attack types, and then from there be able to measure the how the uh, the controls actually the effectiveness of the of the controls. So earlier in 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 sort of the the genesis of, of CIS, it, it it was more of like a you know a, a set of controls based on the expertise of of industry practitioners. It, it's got to be pretty satisfying to see the data now that we have these sources of data. 
the data really you know prove out the conclusions that that CIS had come to with which controls were most important to start with it feels like a an important connection to make and an important justification for the work that CIS has kind of done all along around the controls yeah that's exactly right i mean and so we're actually backing up our choices for um, actions that we want organizations to take to protect themselves from cyber attack with actual data now uh, before like i said it was it was you know the community that was kind of bringing that forth but now we actually we can now um, cite data sources um, and that's what we've done within the community defense model so it's very satisfying i mean and and we make that uh, um, very open and transparent everyone can see what data sources we're using and what recommendations we're, we're making based off of uh of the um the uh, um, attack techniques that we've identified through miter attack uh the framework yeah, so that's interesting. It, it makes me think about you know what how you how do you expect organizations to use the the CDM? I mean, I understand how they they look at the controls themselves, but you've created this this artifact that provides evidence. What do you expect organizations to to do with that? The, I guess the way I would describe it as uh, is you know the community defense model really exists to provide the data behind the prioritization of the controls. And in particular, you know, the set of safeguards that, that can be described as essential cyber hygiene, just like with the, um, you know, here in the U.S., the Centers for Dece uh, Disease Control, you know, they, they do research and we rely on their experts to tell us that, you know, for example, uh, washing hands and, and mask wearing uh, are really good preventive measures or hygiene to help, you know, mitigate the spread of germs. Well, we've done, you know, something very similar to what the CDC does uh, for the community, you know, and we and what we've done is taken those data sources and actually from that, um, you know, um, measure back what are the preventive measures, you know, for, for cybersecurity that are that are effective. Um, but just to be clear, these are preventive measures and they're not and what we've done is not perfect um but it really does back up your choices you know and on what you what actions you need to take not to get infected i think that's actually an important point to make that what we're talking about with with cis and with the controls and with the the cdm is is a way to prioritize the implementation of preventive controls there's a lot of conversation uh in the industry today about detective controls and i think you know, for for folks who've been in the industry for for a long time and seen this this pendulum swing back and forth a couple of times, it it does happen that you know for a period of time we'll be focused on prevention and then people will get disenchanted with preventing uh, successful attacks and they'll move to detecting them and then you know it might swing back the other way. But this idea that that um, which I've seen communicated in a couple of of different ways lately that somehow. Um, prevention is a you know a hopeless cause that you can't effectively prevent control, so you have to focus on detection and response. It seems like the the CDM and the the evidence it provides really you know gives data to reject that premise that prevention is a hopeless cause. Yeah, no, Tim, I I absolutely agree. I, I'll tell you, I'm also an optimist, um, and every time I've you know I've seen a uh, a cyber breach, you know, the large ones, you know, I always, I always try to go back to well, what the root cause was. And it always comes back to just a little bit of prevention would have actually protected you uh, from that attack, you know, and it, and it goes back to, you know, what we call essential cyber hygiene, you know, which is a set of uh, controls and underlying safeguards, you know, that, that we can prove now that are effective uh, in, in, in either mitigating or breaking uh, up an attacker's uh, attack pattern uh, in that regard. And so um, I, I really think it's it's an important step for us and, and within the community. Um, and it really demonstrates the importance of um, a few uh, set of actions that if organizations will take, uh, it will save them a lot of pain um, should there be a should there be a cyber breach. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. Why? Because we detect suspicious activity before it becomes breach. Our systems work on-site and in the cloud to find, monitor, and minimize a wide range of threats. 
With deep system visibility and automated compliance, we help you shorten the time it takes to catch vulnerabilities and ensure your organization is following the absolute best practices in cybersecurity today. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. Well, let, let's talk a little bit about the, the conclusions. Um, and, and for folks who aren't familiar, uh, maybe just a little bit of background. So CIS has a set of uh, you know critical security controls that um, underneath each control is a set of safeguards, right? And um, and those are you know they're they're semantically connected. Um, but what the CDM did was look at the mapping of, if I understand correctly, the mapping of safeguards to uh, attack techniques in the in the MITRE attack framework. And so then the the result is that that the CDM points out the um, the safeguards that are most effective for addressing those attack techniques. And and what were some of the conclusions that are, are most interesting or most valuable for organizations out of that work? Yeah. So Tim, I'd tell you, you know, um, the, the, the overarching uh, conclusion from, uh, from our analysis was that, you know, we verified that the CIS controls, you know, are highly effective at defending against uh, approximately 80% of the attack, techniques found within the MITRE ATT&CK framework. And more importantly, uh, the controls are really uh, effective against the top five attack types found uh, in, again, uh, we use 35 different industry um, threat data sources, um, you know, f for this analysis. And the bottom line really is that, uh, you know, our, our CIS controls and specifically what we call implementation group one, which is a set of 56 safeguards are a really a robust foundation, you know, for for your cybersecurity program, and we urge every organization to start with uh, implementation group one, and uh, Im and then implement your cybersecurity program around um, around that set of um, of safeguards. I uh, I would tell you the other um, the other key point here was that um, you know it, it's very you know what our analysis also proved that it was. Uh, that in, the importance of establishing and maintaining a secure configuration process as a safeguard, again, for all, all five attack types for that. So configuration management truly does matter when it comes to um, protecting yourself against um, um, various uh, attack types. Yeah, I think that that, um, that first uh, safeguard in the the control number four, which is is you know secure configuration management. The first safeguard 4.1 is um, establish and maintain a secure configuration process, and the analysis sort of bubbled that one up to the top as having uh, the biggest impact of a as a single safeguard on on the number of attack techniques that that it would protect against. And I I, I find that really interesting because we 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 work in an industry where um, we're talking about uh, you know, on a daily basis about artificial intelligence, about, you know, unique uh, tools that are being developed in the market. And uh, the reality is that just making sure that you, you've you configured your environment securely and that it stays configured securely is probably the most effective thing you can do based on this data in order to prevent successful attacks. Yeah, that that's exactly right. You know, the, the community defense model found that having a secure configuration is is job number one um, the, the the most effective uh, primitive measure you can use to mitigate uh, against the uh, all of you know at least against the five top attacks uh, attack types that we we identified uh, for that you know and you know a question folks will ask is why is that well this is because many attacks occur due to misconfiguration um, for example many insider and uh, and privileged misuse attacks occur because users have access to data and or applications unnecessarily. Additionally, many attacks occur due to uh, unnecessary ports and protocols left open and unprotected. An example of that would be, uh, say, um, some of the web application hacking attacks that, we, that we've seen uh, recently. You know, also, um, you know, a secure configuration satisfies many security controls in in not only within the CIS critical security controls, but also with other other frameworks such as NIST cybersecurity framework or ISO uh, twenty seven thousand one. So that that's um, that's really why we've been working on tighter mappings between um, our 
CIS benchmarks and our CIS critical security controls just to show how implementing a benchmark can satisfy not just a control in our own framework, but eventually controls in other frameworks. Yeah, and I think I think this is a um, a point that maybe um, or maybe a little bit of explanation that, that people don't always you know intuitively understand that they're they're the CIS controls and then they're the benchmarks and the controls are uh, you know a, a, a relatively high level explanation or technology agnostic might be the better way to put it explanation of security controls that are you know um, important to put in place they're grouped and prioritized as we've been talking about the benchmarks on the other hand are specific sets of configurations for specific platforms and technology. How do you think about the relationship between those two things? Yeah, you know, so I kind of, you know, my uh, easy way of thinking about it is, you know, you know, I say start secure um, and and how do you start secure? And that's with individual, as you point out, uh, pl- uh, products or platforms. And so, for example, if you happen to be in a, um, your environment is, you know, is, is, tied to, um, you know, Microsoft and, and Windows, um, then, you know, you want to secure those, um, those Windows um, 10 now, Windows 11 uh, endpoints, right? And so uh-huh. in, in order to configure them, you need some type of, you know, secure configuration um, recommendations. And that's what, uh, that's what the CIS benchmarks are. So those are individual products within an environment. And then if you want to stay secure, you think about your environment, it's bigger than just individual products. Um, and that's where the um, the set of critical security controls and, and the underlying safeguards uh, come into action. And so that's where you would actually measure your cybersecurity, you know, program um, within within your environment using uh, u- using the CIS controls for that. But think product, think benchmark, and then think um, environment, think um, you know, critical security controls. When we talk about critical security controls, I mean these. There's been there have been changes over time in the controls that are included and in the the you know the the prioritization of those controls. But the reality is that over the the life of those controls, that that change has been, uh, relatively speaking, minimal. I mean, there's sort of a core set of controls that have have persisted. Why do you think this is a conversation that we're still struggling to have? That organizations are still, given the evidence that implementing just the the essential group of controls is so effective at preventing attacks. Why isn't that a, a done deal with organizations? What's the challenge that you see in the market? Yeah, you know, Tim, that's a that's a really great question. I, I think there's um, two reasons behind it. Um, number one is um, I think there's um, there's you know varying or different frameworks. Um, each one with different um, with a different set of controls and safeguards. Yes, there is. Uh, a fair amount of overlap, um, but each one is is slightly different, and the prioritization is is different uh, for those. And so, what we tried to do uh, here at uh, the Center for Internet Security was, you know, I'm not trying to offer yet another framework. Um, what I'm trying to offer is a prioritized set of actions that we want you to take. So, for example, if you happen to be implementing the NIST cybersecurity framework. Well, how you implement it is is by using the CIS critical security controls. So that's really point one. I think you know there's just um, uh, a bit of mis- uh, there's too many frameworks available, uh, and so you're giving the uh, users too many options in, in in some sense. I think the the more critical uh, um, answer or point to make is really is around you know what we you know w- which are our first three controls, and those are inventory of assets. Uh, inventory of of software and and data protection, you know, fundamentally that is the foundation um, for everything that we do in security. Um, you know, if you don't know your environment, I don't know how you protect um, your environment. And so, so that's why we have as our top three controls, you know, hardware ass, hardware inventory, software inventory, and now um, inventory or, or or data protection. Um, and that was that was a a sea change for us with version yeah. eight of the um, of the critical security controls. We moved, you know, data protection up to to uh, to control number three um, because it just made sense to us. We, we're we're tracking hardware, we're tracking software. Well, we by God, we ought to kind of know where the uh, our sensitive data is is uh, is located within our within our enterprise and and do an effective job of protecting that. Um, but you know. Um, 
what we find is a, a number of organizations will tell us um, that maintaining, creating and maintaining an inventory for hardware, software, and, and now data um, is, is difficult for them. And so I think that's where organizations struggle. Um, what I would tell you is, is, you know, you know, there, there has to be processes in place for any, any enterprise and, you know, for that enterprise, how you, how you acquire assets and how you acquire software, you have to, you have to build processes, you know, for that, mm. where you maintain your software. And I, you know, uh, I'm sorry, where you maintain your, your data. And that's critically important today, Tim, because, you know, largely we're, we're a remote workforce The you know, the pandemic kind of, you know, drove us in that direction, although we were moving in that direction to begin with. Um, and, you know, where that data is actually maintained now, uh, I would urge, you know, folks to maybe centralize it within a cloud environment so that wherever you are, you happen to be in the world that you can, you can access it from one um, single location. But, you know, it's, it's the, the various frameworks, and then I think just you know the around the first three controls has been has been what's been difficult for um, for organizations to uh, to start. Now, the final thing I'll say is that you know we made a, a huge change with um, version seven point one of the controls, and we and it's now also within version eight, um, and that was by you know breaking up our. 20 controls and uh and our 171 safeguards that were part of version 7.1 we broke them into three groups and you know we call them implementation groups and um, we we strongly believe that implementation group one is is should be the basis for what we call essential cyber hygiene and you know and every organization should be um implementing those set of actions first and then measuring themselves against uh, against those actions. But, you know, why is it why is it um, difficult or hard for organizations to implement? Um, I think I think they just need to understand where to start. They need to just choose a framework. Um, and then from that, then be very diligent about, you know, some of the, you know, some of the processes about, you know, knowing your environment, which is knowing where your hardware, your software and where your data exists. And with the the community defense model, with the work and the 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 data and evidence included there, they've got real information that justifies that prioritization of those essential controls for or, you know the the implementation group one controls for essential hi- cyber hygiene that that is based on on actual data as opposed to just you know the expertise of of people in the industry. I think that that does make a difference because it, in the the cybersecurity industry, you have lots of vendors who are pushing their their solutions and they bring data and evidence uh, that their solution is the right thing to implement. Um, having an, an independent group like CIS produce that kind of result, I think, is is pretty valuable for organizations to, to have something to look at that doesn't involve them going and reading all of those individual reports and drawing their conclusions and also isn't driven by you know, a vendor motivation to, to sell a product ultimately. Yeah, that that's exactly right. And I, I'll tell you, that was one of the chief motivations um, for why I came to the Center for Internet Security. I I had spent my first career at the National Security Agency and, and really did at the time, we were calling it um, information, um, information security and then information assurance. And now it's uh, now it's cybersecurity. But really what motivated me was, was um, being able to actually make a difference um, from the perch of a nonprofit, from a small nonprofit, I would add. Um, you know, so you're always going to have um, a segment that may have, you know, some distrust in, in government. Um, and then you have a, a segment that may, um, you know, that are using commercial commercial products. But, you know, there's, there's typically a reason behind um, um, that commercial product and 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 how they're um, articulating uh, the advantages of that product. When you have a small nonprofit that's neither a for-profit company and it's not government, um, but it really is a is a global community of cybersecurity practitioners that really have kind of come together and said that we believe these are the the set of actions that every organization should take. 
you know, again, we, we call them the critical security controls. Um, and, you know, we open that up. Here's our transparent uh, process for how we come to uh, uh, come to the conclusion that these are the set of um, set of actions that we want you to take. Um, I just think um, it it provides an opportunity for public and private sector to rally around and give um give themselves a you know an, an ability to actually protect themselves against uh, today's you know real world um you know cyber attacks you are listening to the tripwire cybersecurity podcast thousands of organizations rely on tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs for more information visit tripwire.com that's tripwire.com. If folks are looking for uh, an interesting read on, you know, the market uh, threat landscape um, and the the evidence about which controls actually make the most difference in, in preventing the, the most prevalent types of attacks, I, I'd go, you should look at the community defense model because it really is interesting. It's not a, it's a, it's a, a detailed document, but you can read parts of it and get a pretty clear picture um, and that evidence that's independent, as you point out, um, you know, government independent and vendor independent is, I think, occupies a unique space um, in this industry. So, Kurt, I, I want to thank you for the time. I think it was a really interesting conversation. I really appreciate what um, what CIS is is doing in this latest development from CIS is, uh, you know, even more value for the the folks who are who are out there um, practicing cybersecurity these days. Well, Tim, um, first, thank you for having me on the podcast. Um, yeah, I got to tell you, it's a um, it's a little bit of out of body experience for me. I mean, I'd spent, like I said, I'd spent my career at the National Security Agency, where you know you really didn't want to talk uh, publicly about anything. Um, but you know, but for you to have me on, you know, and 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 for you to um, you know identify the community defense model is is an important um, uh, you know. Um, contribution to the global cybersecurity community is, is really important. And, and secondly, I would also uh, be remiss if I didn't point out that, uh, you know, Tripwire, you know, that sponsors this podcast, you know, they are also, uh, they contribute mightily into our community and we, we support, uh, we, we appreciate uh, what they do for, uh, for a small nonprofit. Thank you so much, Kurt. And thank you to everyone who listened. I hope it was um, as interesting for you as it was to me uh, and that you'll tune in for the next episode of the uh, Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. You have been listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Join us next time as we explore stories of people protecting people and techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. We'll talk to you next time on the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast.